famous Amos Lozano. Thank you very much for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, bro. It's an honor to uh, be on your podcast today and uh, reconnect with you again. Yeah, absolutely. So we had met uh, for the first time at NOCO. It was about a month and a half ago now. Had a good conversation. Had some mutual friends. So I had seen some of the stuff that you did on social media. But I, before we had talked, I had really only seen like the MJ's hemp apparel stuff that you were doing. And then mm-hmm. through the conversations and seeing you at the pitch contest at NOCO, learned a little bit more about all the stuff that you have going on. So if you could just briefly introduce yourself and kind of highlight some of the stuff that you're working on now. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Amos Lozano. I am 29 years old. I was born and raised and currently reside in San Antonio, Texas, where I've launched my uh, hemp businesses. The first company I launched was in 2014, actually. Uh, I started Famous Juice Company with $29 from my parents' kitchen. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, I was just learning business and it was not cannabis related at all. Um, but over a couple years of running that company, I learned about the benefits of juicing raw cannabis. And I knew that one day I wanted to, um, you know, create the brand around being a cannabis use company whenever the laws would permit it. And so now we're in the process of, uh, launching our first store as a cannabis juice company and cannabis brand. Uh, our store is actually built out of hemp Creek too. And then I also run and founded MJ's hemp. Uh, we do, we launched originally as a pre-roll brand. Uh, using hemp made packaging and that's still what we do as well as pre-roll processing for local farms and retailers that want to outsource their pre-roll manufacturing and then we also have uh, hemp apparel and hemp goods we're actually setting up where I'm at right now this is our studio and like we're setting up our retail space with more hemp goods and hemp made items so we have a bunch of uh, hemp goods coming in this week like hemp belts, hemp hats, hemp underwear, hemp sunglasses, hemp backpacks, hemp shoes. And so eventually it'll be a store where everything you purchase in the store will be hemp made. And it could be a table, it could be a rug, it could be curtains, a pillowcase, a blanket, t-shirt, everything will be hemp made. And that was kind of my original vision with MJ's. And so it's finally starting to become more well-rounded, but those are the companies and things that I'm working on currently. Nice. Thanks for that quick rundown. Is there anything like that in San Antonio, like a fully dedicated hemp store where you can get pretty much anything made out of hemp? I don't know that there's any or many in the entire United States. Um, there's so the, yeah. so the, no, no, there's not one in San Antonio. And yeah. I, as far as I know, there isn't really, I mean, there's the hempist in Boston that comes to mind. Yep. Um, and there's probably a couple other smaller ones that I just don't know about, but there's really, there's really not a lot of just like hemp stores where you go there and everything is hemp made and it's all under one roof. You know, you've got a bunch of different brands like, you know, that are, you know, maybe they make wallets and or backpacks and they make t-shirts and they make 3d printed things, but all under one house, all those things is, was, is my vision, you know, creating a retail outlet for all of these people that are innovating new hemp made products, bring them all under one roof where the customer can see and shop all of them. Yep. Nice. Yeah. yeah the hemp is in Boston. Long- there, yeah. No, there's a couple in, in new England, just like small ones up in Vermont and stuff too. But the hemp is, it's crazy. They started in like the late nineties, I think. So they've been yeah. on Newberry street in Boston for a long time. But yeah, besides that, there's not, there's not many. So that's cool that you're doing that. Um, yeah. Awesome. So what, like when we talked in, in Colorado, you had mentioned that, you know, you had the idea for MJ's long before you kind of started the company. So what was it that first brought you to hemp? Like what sparked your interest in hemp in the first place or the cannabis plant in general? For sure. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking about it with um, with our team earlier. But basically, let's see, where do I start with this? Um, I was I had started going to community college here in San Antonio at San Antonio College. And I just found myself in a philosophy course and um, I met this teacher, Dr. Sadler, and he's the best teacher I've ever had. And he taught me how to think for myself and question what I believed and uh, question authority and just to question things. Right. And so um, in that process of him just expanding and opening my mind, I started to think about my own life and my own habits and things like that. And one of the things that was becoming prominent in my life was I was starting to use cannabis more. 
but I was feeling guilty when I would get high and like, you know, have a good time with my friends. And I didn't understand why I was so guilty about this, you know, but also I did understand is because of all the stigmas around the plant and I didn't know the truth about the plant. That was the root of it is that I didn't know what was real and what was true. And so, um, through that experience, I was like, well, let me just go find out what is the truth. And so I had an hour and a half break between my classes that semester. And so I would just go to the computer lab and I would just research and study the history of cannabis. And I researched, uh, you know, just answering fundamental questions that came to my mind. Like I didn't know at the time, when did cannabis become illegal? What is the law that made it illegal? Why did it become illegal? Who made it illegal? Um, what is the root of the rumors about the plant, both good and bad? Uh, and where are the studies, you know, like, you know, the popular, rumor was that it kills your brain cells. Okay, cool. Where's the study? And how was it conducted? And who conducted it? And who paid for it? And so all these were the types of questions I started asking, which then led to more questions and then led to more. And in that journey, prior to that, I had never heard of industrial hemp. And I had never heard of hemp paper, hemp plastic, hemp apparel, hemp herd. I didn't know that cannabis could be used for other things other than just getting high, you know, which mm. is the stigma. That is the root of the stigma around the plant is that it's just about getting high. And so that's how we help break that stigma is introducing the other uses and applications and history of the plant. It helps to break that down. And that that's what broke down in me. You know, the stigma and the guiltiness and the shame I was feeling was eliminated once I realized that we're not doing anything wrong. We're not doing anything immoral. In fact, everything is right about this plant. Um, the only thing wrong with it is that they made it illegal. That's literally it. And so I became very inspired and passionate and and to be honest i was pissed off you know i got um i was upset because this whole time you know this was my thought i was 18 years old at the time this whole time there's been a more sustainable source of paper there's been a more sustainable source of fuel there's been a more sustainable source of food of building material of um plastics and uh so many other things and a lot of these things not only did we know about them, but they had been the primary, you know, plant to use it for, whether it was ropes or cells or canvas or even paper. The first, you know, Bible on the Gutenberg press was printed on hemp paper. The first book ever. It's crazy on hemp paper. Mm -hmm. And it was the Bible, you know, it was the first book. Um, and so when I learned all these things and I learned that this country is literally built on hemp, I was upset that this whole time there's been a sustainable source and this whole time they knowingly chose to not only u not use it, but make it illegal and demonize it and and uh, slander it and use marijuana to make it seem like it was this dangerous drug. And so um, I quickly lost my trust for any trust for the government at that point, which then also led me down looking into other industries like the food industry, the pharmaceutical industry, all these other industries that are equally, if not more, as fucked up. I don't know if I can cuss on your podcast. No, yeah, you're good. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, and so that that's what really lit the fire in me that has been burning to this day. Uh, and that's when I made the decision that one day I'm going to start a hemp company and we're going to educate people about the industrial aspects of cannabis and we're going to support the industrial aspects of the plant. And I could just see I had a vision, you know, even back then, this is 2011. I had a vision of a more sustainable world with hemp as that cornerstone. And I had a vision of a multi-billion dollar industry, which we all know about. Um, but, you know, when people talk about cannabis, they automatically start thinking about and talking about marijuana and marijuana dispensaries and marijuana grow operations and how much money it makes and how much tax money. And I'm like, it makes a lot of money and it helps a lot of people. But that is mm -hmm. going to be a tiny speck of the income and tax revenue that the entire industrial hemp industry is going to make. Because we're talking about mammoth industries that run the entire world that make the foundation of our world economies that hemp could literally and will disrupt. And so they're far bigger. They're going to have a far bigger impact on our economy, uh, the industrial applications of cannabis and on our environment than marijuana. And uh, it's just, it's interesting that people get so caught up on this, this little segment of the industry, but it is, it's, you know, on the surface, it's sexier, I guess. <laughs> But that's yeah. kind of the origin of it all. And I also back then came up with the name MJs. I didn't know what I was going to do or how I was going to start or when I was going to start. But all I knew 
was this. This was my one thing that I knew in 2011. One day I'm going to start a hemp company and I'm going to name it MJ's. That's all I knew at that point. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, nice. I appreciate that background. Yeah, that's one of the things that kind of bothers me. It bothered when I first learned about it and continues to bother me now is that there was they knew about the separation of the industrial side of things and, and the high THC and other cannabinoid side of things, but they just lumped it all together and kind of made it seem uh, like it was all just one thing and kind of confused people. So yeah, I'm right the there only, with you. Actually. The only established modern country that did so, you know, every other country, China, Japan, all the European countries, like they all distinguish a difference between the drug type of cannabis and the industrial type of cannabis. And they made mm -hmm. separate laws. We were the only country that did not, that treated them the same. So that was, that yeah. was also very frustrating. But yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> so that didn't no, happen. yeah, no. And, and then we see things like now, I mean, just with, with textiles, like you're in this, in that business as well. China makes the best hemp textiles. They never stopped doing, they never stopped mm -hmm. making hemp textiles. Like if we kind of were in the same boat, we'd probably be able to source hemp textiles from the United States fairly easily. That's all starting to come back. So it's exciting to kind of be in the space now to see this revitalization of all these things. And so, um, that's, I feel like it's a similar path that people go on. Like they consume cannabis recreationally at whatever age. And then they are like, all right, well, what's actually the story with all this stuff. And then it just is a deep, never ending rabbit hole that people can go yeah. down with a lot of different yeah. tunnels in it. So cool. A lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so 2011, you know, you're going to start MJ's, you don't know exactly what it's going to be. And then a few years later, um, you start famous juice company. And so mm -hmm. in the beginning, did you, I just listened to your podcast on it's eat plants, move off and right is where people yeah. can find your podcast. Cool. So I yeah, listened to the, sure. I listened to the story of famous juice company. And so mm -hmm. in the beginning, you, you wanted to use hemp and cannabis, but it just wasn't feasible at the time, 2013, 2014 in Texas. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, part of it was the biggest issue was that you need fresh leaf, you know, like in, and so, and that basically means it needs to be local. And then, but I had been in contact with some out-of-state farmers that were operating under the 2014 Farm Bill. And I reached out to some of them just to kind of see, you know, what this might look like. And most of them either extracted their, they included their leaf material in their biomass for extraction, um, or they, you know, dried it and just composted it or, you know, threw it away, disposed of it. Um, or if they were willing to ship it to me, by the time it got here, it'd be wilted and not fresh enough to juice. Mm. So it, it has to be local, you know, it, in order to have fresh juice, you need fresh ingredients. And yep. we did not have any hemp laws passed here in Texas yet. You know, 2018 Farm Bill hadn't even passed yet. Um, so it was still a Schedule One substance, even hemp was. Um, so I had to wait until Texas passed, um, you know, laws allowing for the cultivation here. And mm -hmm. so in 2020, when that happened, with literally the first license that went out um, within their, when the plants were even, you know, teenagers, so to speak, that's what we were harvesting leaf and we were juicing cannabis here in Texas for the first time legally, um, maybe nice. ever. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I, I don't know if they were juicing stuff back in the early 1900s and late 1800s. Yeah, maybe they were. I don't know, but Who maybe knows? somebody. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, I encourage, uh, we won't go super into like the history of famous juice company, but I encourage people to go check out your podcast to listen to that whole story. It's like 40 minutes and it's cool to kind of get background on you and kind of what that whole story was. Um, could you quickly highlight kind of how you got into juicing and, um, where you were at in your life and what that did to change your life essentially? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, I had like a health crisis in 2013. I've been an athlete my whole life and um, basically, uh, to sum it up, I was overtraining and eating extremely shitty, you know, processed foods, lots of meat and dairy, um, fast foods, and a lot of supplements. And I was pushing myself mentally, physically. Um, and so that put me in like a situation where I had these widespread muscle spasms and similar symptoms as some autoimmune diseases. I went to five different doctors and none of them had any like solutions for me or um, any answers for me. So I started looking into like alternative, you know, modes of healing and holistic um, things. And I discovered juicing, raw fruits and vegetables. And it just made sense to me, you know, juicing um, plants, 
so they're in a very bioavailable form for your body it makes sense and so i did a series of juice fasts that significantly reduced the symptoms that were like halting my life and then eventually made them disappear and so then i went plant-based vegetarian for about a year and then i went fully vegan um, and stopped consuming animals entirely because it's what made me feel the best and uh, started learning about the impact of factory farming and stuff like that and so then i wanted to share that with my friends and family you know and um put that out on facebook and people started calling me and texting me and messaging me want to learn more and i realized there was an opportunity to help people and so that's kind of how the, organically the business got started like that but uh juicing for me was just like the turning point in my health and also it's the cornerstone of like my plant-based lifestyle and how i get um you know larger amounts of fruits and vegetables in my diet that we all should have but yep. cannabis is also a vegetable and it's very nutrient dense and people don't think of it as a nutrient dense leafy green that should be a part of your lifestyle it should be, it's a it's an essential part of any healthy lifestyle and that with famous juice that's what we're trying to teach and educate and um make more accessible is incorporating raw cannabinoids into your diet okay cool so could you go into a little bit of detail about like where famous juice company is at now with kind of the next stage of the development of the company and the brand yeah for sure so i'll do a quick little background before i say where we're at now i ended up closing the company in 2019 for a year i closed all of 2019 famous juice was closed while i was launching and growing mj's um, because at that point I didn't know how to scale a company. You know, I started with nothing and I had no prior business experience and I grew it to a point where it was, it was going to need, it needed more, you know, it needed more people. It, I was a solopreneur and needed a bigger team and needed more resources. It just needed more. It needed more time, energy, and money. Essentially, we can sum it up by saying that. And at the same time, I was diverting my time, energy, and money into MJ's. And so I was faced with this decision. It was like, okay, I can spend my time and energy and money like turning things around and growing and scaling famous juice or right now the opportunity is presenting itself to launch mj's and learn from the lessons and things that i've learned from launching famous juice um and like i just talked about that was my original intention was to start a hemp company i didn't intend to start a juice company it just kind of happened and so i was like i can't not do this you know i can't not go all in on on my original vision and dream and so that's what I decided to do. It was a tough decision. And then we relaunched the juice company in a zero waste store that, that I co-founded with somebody else, another partner in 2020, operated from there. It was called the Reup Station. And I left that partnership because it just wasn't a good fit. We didn't have the same values and we just, we just wasn't a good fit for a partnership. So I split from there. And then Famous Juice was left without a home again. And up until this point, you know, I never had my own location for Famous Juice. I always operated out of co-op stores or co-op kitchens. And so I was like, okay, I'm either going to close the company permanently at this point or um, I'm going to do something I've never done, which is raise, raise capital and hire a team, get the best location, get the best equipment, don't compromise on the things like you have to do when you're bootstrapping. Uh, and so I decided to do that because, uh, and this is just advice for any entrepreneur or anybody in general when you're thinking about a risk. I was thinking about, well, what would my life look like if I didn't do this, if I didn't raise capital and see what would happen if I took this approach with Famous Shoes? How would I feel on my deathbed if I never found out what would have happened? And I just couldn't live with myself. That was my answer. It was like, I wouldn't be able to live with myself not knowing because there's a part of me that knows what's going to happen. That It's going to explode and we're going to help a lot of people and then we're going to innovate and do something really cool. And so that's what we decided to do. Uh, raised some capital. We're still currently raising as well. And where we're at right now is we we're about 90% done with the first location. It's 240 square feet built out of hempcrete on site of a vertically integrated hemp farm that will also be growing the greens for our juices. So it's literally uh, like, like uh, I guess, um, farm to bottle experience. You can see the plants where they're growing, where you'll be ordering and seeing the juice being made in front of you. It's really cool. Um, we had a bunch of delays. We were supposed to be open months ago, uh, but you know how it goes with building and then building with something new like hempcrete um, and then having new relationships and new vendors and stuff. So what we're going through right now is a permitting process, getting the building permitted. 
And so the challenges we're um, incurring is about the size of the building, the location. Uh, it turns out we can't get it permitted as a permanent building where it's at. And so what we, are, what we have to do in this next week is we're actually going to bring a crane out. We're going to lift up the building and we're going to put it onto a trailer. They got custom built. We just got it uh, this week, actually, from Tennessee. And uh, then we'll attach it to that trailer. And then we'll proceed with getting it permitted as a mobile food unit, basically like a food trailer. Um, and, but for our city, for our county, it has to be on wheels for it to be considered mobile. And so that's what we have to do. And so that's where we're at right now. Hopefully, within a month or so, we'll be wrapping up the permitting process and we'll start to have a soft opening and eventually a grand opening. But uh, it's been delayed, you know, which is frustrating. But at the same time, we're slowly achieving the milestones. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I was going to ask kind of what's been one of the most challenging things working on this, being at Hempcre and, and kind of a new material. But I think you kind of just answered that there. Um, is it going to be something where you can move it around or are you guys going to stay in that one location? No, it'll be primarily, it, it'll be, it'll be in one place. So it'll be mobile in the sense that a mobile home is mobile, mm. you know? So it's, it's larger, it's, it's 12 feet by 20 feet. So it's much larger than like a food trailer, mm -hmm. but it's much smaller than like a mobile home. So it's like in between. And so it's not what, what the way I communicate it is it's not, it's theoretically mobile, but it's not practically mobile. You know, so like, yes, we could move it and we can take it places, but we're not going to because then also like the, the the plaster, once we do the final plaster, which we haven't done yet, it'll crack and it'll it's not meant, you know, the building itself is not really meant to be like traveling around. It's just mm -hmm. more so we're doing it that way as a hack for the permitting, you know. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. You know, yeah. As cannabis entrepreneurs, we have to be innovative and creative and find our loopholes, unfortunately. That's how we have to navigate the world and the industry right now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one of the biggest barriers to kind of getting more hempcrete structures built all across the country really is, is permitting and each location is different. And these people, these code enforcement officers are not familiar with the material and you tell them you don't want to put a vapor barrier on the building. And they're like, what are you talking about? This is not how, this is not how we build buildings. Uh, I'm thinking about putting a shed. I'm, I'm moving to a different, uh, location this summer and I'm thinking about putting a hemp, uh, hempcrete shed on the property. And so I Yo. talked to the, I talked to the town and I was like, what's the biggest footprint that I can get without needing a building permit. And in this specific town, it's 200 square feet. So I'm, I'm nice. thinking about getting like a 196 square foot hempcrete structure put up. So I won't need any Yo. permitting or anything. It'll be really easy. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of one of the biggest barriers. But so you're working with people in Texas who are familiar familiar with this whole process. You're not like casting the hempcrete yourself and kind of running the job. Yeah, no, we work with uh, Ray um, to contract him to build it out. And uh, I mean, although I did help um, and I'm familiar with what the process is like, I, I wanted it to be not another project on my table where it's like, it's, it's going to only get done if I'm working on it. Like I've got too much on my plate already. Mm -hmm. I needed it to be where somebody else is going to see this thing through and have it finished and completed. And it's their responsibility. Um, so yeah, we contracted that workout. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's a lot, especially if you're, you guys did cast in place, right? Oh no. Where did yep. you do the individual wall panels and then kind of put them up or what was the build process no, for that? We did cast in place. Cast in place. Cool. Nice. Yep. Yeah, it's good. You, it seems like you guys have like a strong community in Texas of people doing a lot of different things at hemp from growing to everything you're doing to the building stuff that Ray's doing. It's it's cool to see kind of the community that's developed in Texas. Yeah, it's a small community, but um, but yeah, we definitely got some good some good players and some good people in, you know, a whole wave of people have come and gone um, who were in it just for the money or not from the culture and not in it for the long run. And we're seeing another wave come and go, you know, it just, it is what it is. There's those of us that were planning on being in this industry before many, you know, long ago, and we plan on being in it forever for the rest of our lives. And then there are those people that were never a part of the plant and they see the trend and they see opportunity to capitalize on it. And, uh, they just get in and get out and make some money. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we've definitely seen a wave of people go, but the real ones are still here. <laughs> nice. That's good to hear. Cool. 
So let's talk a little bit about like juicing cannabis microgreens. So we're, yeah. we're planting a seed, letting it grow for a couple of weeks, harvesting that couple um, uh, like stem, not stems, but like a couple fan leaves that have developed. And then that's what you're juicing, right? Yep. Primarily leaf. Okay, cool. And so I know we talked a little bit about this um, in Colorado, but have you done any testing on like raw flower juicing? Like, I've juiced that... it. I haven't done any testing at all on any of it. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll do testing once we're open. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've juiced raw flower myself. Yeah. What does it taste so, like? Do you get the terpenes come through or what's that experience like? Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. If anything, you know, you get, um, there's a lot of, it's kind of loaded. So, um, for sure you taste the terpenes, you get the benefits of the terpenes as well. Um, because when you heat, when you heat up the plant and you like, when you smoke, you know, like cannabis flower, a lot of those terpenes get destroyed. You still get the flavors in there. Um, but even like, you know, we have studies on terpenes and their benefits. Those studies are done on the terpenes, not heated. So there's a big question of if those benefits still apply once it's been combusted. Um, so there's, there is incentive to keep it unheated and in its raw form uh, from a new nutritive standpoint, um, chemical standpoint, but then from a flavor standpoint, yeah, you, you can taste the terps for sure. And it definitely tastes like cannabis, you know, it's got a herb taste to it, but you know, a lot of people, when I tell them we're a cannabis juice bar and we do cannabis juice, they, for some reason, it's interesting. They think that we only sell like just straight up a hundred percent hemp juice. It's like, well, no, that's, you know, it's like wheatgrass. Like it's not, doesn't taste that great by itself. It's a leafy green. Um, you mix it with lemon and ginger and cucumbers and apples and other vegetables. And then you have a blend where that's just another ingredient, you know? And I think part of it is, is it's still furthering people out of the stigma you know, and part of that stigma is that it's like just the plant. And it's like, no, the plant is a vegetable, just like spinach and kale and uh, parsley and, you know, other things, Swiss chard. It's it's just another ingredient, you know, and yes, it is special um, because it has other uses too. But at the same time, it's just another part of the family of these fruits and vegetables that we should be eating. You know, it's not like um, you should only eat it or it's not like it's going to solve every single problem on earth. It'll solve a lot of them though. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting. So you definitely taste it though. And it's different. It's more pungent. That flavor, that herb flavor, the turp flavor is more pungent with flour when you're juicing the flour versus when you're just juicing the leaf. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm sure part of your process on a daily or weekly basis is just like recipe testing right like do you have a set menu like is the menu already created with like the different juices that you're gonna have or is it kind of like a someone will walk in and say i want those five things juiced together what's the experience going to be like for someone who in the near future will go to a famous juice company location yeah for sure so we have a set menu um we don't really do too much like customize mostly because most people don't know how to pick the correct ingredients you know there's actually I have a, a lot of experience in formulating juice recipes. I've even been paid as a consultant. Actually, when Steven, you know Steven, um, when Steven used to be a part of um, the juice technology startup he was in, they flew me out to LA to help them with their recipe formulation. And that was actually kind of like the start of our, me and Steven's relationship. Um, but um, our menu, we have two like separate menus. We have the non, you know, cannabis in, um, juices, they're basically the recipes that I've been selling for the past six years. Um, we have six juice recipes and we have six smoothie recipes. And then we'll have a separate menu that is for cannabis juice blends or hemp juice blends and then four smoothies. And then we have two like acai bowls with non-cannabis and then two acai bowls with them. So that way people can pick, you know, not everybody's going to want them to have uh, hemp inside of it. So we have something for both and people want the classic recipes. And so the mm -hmm. first recipe I formulated, um, I, uh, had an idea of one and the first time we made it, it was on point. So we didn't have to make any tweaks. Like I've just gotten so good with recipe formulation with juice. I can usually nail a recipe on the first try. Um, 
And so the first one, we call it the Sour D. And it is green apple, celery, lime, and hemp leaves. And so it's got like a kind of a slightly sour, a little sweet, you know, flavor to it. Uh, and then the terps from the cannabis play really well in with the lime and the green apple. Um, so that's, it's a really nice flavor profile, that one. Then we got another one with beets um, in it. And so we have a mix, you know, another green one. And yeah, so basically people will come up, they'll walk up, um, they'll decide, you know, we'll ask them kind of what they're looking for. You know, some people are looking for energy before workout. Some people are looking for something that's anti-inflammatory for their arthritis. Some people are looking for something to help them lose weight. And so we'll kind of help direct them to which uh, juices we recommend for whatever reason why they're coming to, to get juice. And then we mm -hmm. also have juice fast packages where people will, um, you know, for anywhere between three to seven days, some cases they go longer. Um, they'll only drink juice for, um, you know, that set amount of days. And so we'll provide them uh, six juices each day. And so those are, those are like cleanse packages that we do as well. And then shots, we have shots too, like lemon, ginger, turmeric. Um, we have, you know, lemon and, and uh, just like a hemp shot or just a straight up, just hemp juice. You just want a two ounce shot of hemp juice, like a wheatgrass shot, but a hemp cool. juice shot. Nice. I haven't had any, I don't, uh, like no cannabis juice at all ever, never tried anything. So I'll do like celery juice most mornings, but I'm like, doing it very old school where all I got is the Vitamix blender. And then I'm like squishing it through it, through a cheesecloth or through like a nut bag. And I could, and I got it down now. I do it pretty quickly, but I'm like, should I get a, a juicer? And I'm, so I'm in between Good. that, that decision right now. Let's yeah. Yeah. Cause that's there's the only thing I, Oh, sorry. Keep going. No, I was just saying there's a place for, people always ask me like, what do you think? Like juices or smoothies are better. And I'm like, both, you don't have to only do one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, I the blender works works well for now, but it's really it's really just the celery that I've done. I haven't really experimented uh, with anything else. But like I've gotten just juices at the store, uh, and like the carrot, orange, lemon, ginger thing. Like that blend is is really good. So getting some hemp in there sounds sounds good. I'm looking forward to to you getting to you getting started and opening that facility. So if you had to guess, like when do you do you have a rough idea of like when this first store might be open? Yeah, it should be uh by the middle of june so far oh nice cool yeah that's yeah. awesome but, and um if everything goes according to plan <laughs> yep yeah. and things change and obviously some hurdles come at, yeah. at certain times a, but it was supposed to be january you know this this january so we're almost six months behind but like i said we're gonna keep going you know delays they're just it just sucks, but it's like, it's not going to stop us. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And so it was cool to hear at NOCO the pit, during the pitch contest, it was cool to hear kind of like the vision. And obviously it was time restricted. So you're trying to run through everything really quickly, but it was cool to see like the whole vision for the company and kind of what your plans are to scale. So the idea is in between it satellites in major cities in Texas, and then locations kind of in between major cities right off the highways to provide like a healthy pit stop type of option, right? For sure. Yep. Drive through only walk up model. Um, I don't know if y'all have any like Dutch bros coffee where y'all are at, or if you heard of them, they just started coming here to Texas. I think they're from California, but basically there, there's some coffee, um, brands that take this model where they have these really tiny locations. They're like, you know, 300 to 500 square feet. They're, they're only walk up and drive through. And, uh, so that's the model we want to create in between the major cities in Texas, because right now when you're traveling between those major cities, which quite a bit of people do, especially as Austin's growing, San Antonio is growing, Houston and Dallas are already, you know, pretty big, but every, everything is exploding here. More and more people are starting to live kind of in the outskirts of the cities and then commuting into the city to work. But once you get outside those city limits, there's really no healthy options. You know, you, you really only have, mcdonald's and burger king and the you know traditional fast food restaurants and there's nothing healthy especially not juice um so that's why we want to serve those areas where uh they're kind of like health food deserts is really what they are uh and to help solve that problem which is a problem that is solved regardless if cannabis is involved or not the cannabis just helps um you know create some brand differentiation and um also helps us introduce the plant and destigmatize it but ultimately, 
it's and this is what I recommend. You know, this is some little side piece of advice for anybody listening that's interested in the cannabis space. Launch a brand or a product that would be successful regardless if it was in cannabis or not, and then find a way to add cannabis into that so that it just helps accentuate and help differentiate you. Don't make it your cornerstone um, necessarily. You can make it a cornerstone of like your vibe and your culture and your your brand and, and the visuals. But if you make it just that, um, it's going to be very competitive very quickly, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of people think that I can just start a cannabis company and I'm just going to money just going to flow in. And it's like, no, especially not now, you know, especially not in hemp. And depending on where you're at, what you want to do, everybody wants to do one of two things. They want to grow or they want to open a dispensary. It's like, bro, there's so much more you could do. There's so much more. Yeah, But uh, yeah, that's always my advice to people is think about something. And so I bring that up to say, even if we weren't doing cannabis juice, that model, we would still be doing it. We would still be opening juice bars in between Texas major cities to offer healthy foods and beverages to the, the um, people of Texas. But adding cannabis in there is just a bonus. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too, because like um, the advice that you gave me in Denver about kind of just getting out in the community and doing pop-ups just talking to people. Uh, I've had a very good experience doing a couple of those so far. The first one was on 420 in the Boston Common, like the center of the city, a big park that everyone goes to to smoke weed on 420 and set oh. that up and, and had a good experience. Um, a lot of younger people in Boston, obviously a ton of colleges and um, like younger urban professionals. Uh, but there was still, it was like one interaction that I vividly remember. There was some older guy walks through and I was just like, Hey, do you want to learn about industrial hemp? And he was like, Oh, that stuff never should have been made legal. Like this is, this is terrible. And I was like, well, and I, and he just started walking away and I, I asked him, I was like, Hey, could you, do you mind just like elaborating on why you feel so strongly about these like hemp? And he kind of just says like, he compares it to cocaine really quickly. And, and <laughs> I was like, well, the, there's no, nothing that you can like consume on this product, on this table. This is all industrial applications of the plant. And he just kind of dismissed it and he kept <laughs> going and, and it was whatever, but it was interesting because I don't get a ton of that. I haven't done a lot of yeah. pop-ups, but like, I don't get a ton of that in Massachusetts. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to, to hear your uh, experience on the stigma in Texas and kind of what people think when you talk about industrial hemp and, and juicing cannabis, like what has that been like? Has there been a lot of like pushback uh, in different conversations that you've had or has it been kind of accepted? Um, so no, no pushback. You know, everybody has this perception that Texas is this super conservative stigmatized towards cannabis place. And the reality is at least where I'm at in San Antonio and the major cities where, where I do events, um, they're very accepting of cannabis. You know, there are some people that aren't really too into it. The ones that are conservative and, you know, the way that people think it is, it's just a handful of politicians that are running our state. But for the most part, the actual people are very accepting and open and um, they want to learn more about it. They want to know about it. Um, they want it. You know, the majority, the, the polls show that the majority of Texans want recreational and medical cannabis. And so, I have very little pushback, you know, every now and then I'll get somebody that um, doesn't really like, you know, mar the marijuana side and getting high with it, but they're totally on board with hemp and they love hemp or, or they've heard about it or they, once they learn about it, they're like, oh, wow, like maybe there's more to this plant. And so that's really my strategy, you know, is like I uh, get people to my table, to my booth with flour and pre-rolls because they're like, what the hell are you doing? This is Texas. And then I'm like, oh yeah, but have you ever seen hemp plastic before? Have you ever held hemp paper? Have you ever felt hemp apparel before? Check this out. Put it in their hands so they, they can touch it and feel it and experience it and realize that this is a real application of cannabis. Uh, and then educate them on our history and the sustainable, um, you know, assets of it. And so I've had very little pushback, which was surprising. I thought there would be more, you know, especially being in Texas. But like I said, I realized what I said earlier was like, oh, wow, people are actually very open and accepting of this. And uh, it's not as stigmatized as it seems to be or as the media portrays it to be or as you in your head think it to be. 
Yeah, or as like the small percentage of politicians are kind of portraying it. Uh, that's that's awesome. That's good to hear. Uh, it's definitely a, a very rewarding experience, kind of having those conversations and and interacting with people who are genuinely curious and like astonished at just a, a simple thing like hemp plastic or hemp paper, or hemp seeds as food. It's it's uh, definitely been rewarding for me to do that here in Massachusetts. So. Yeah. Again, yeah, I, I appreciate that that tip that or that suggestion that you gave me. Kind of what you've done in San Antonio. Uh, I've I've been enjoying doing it here in Boston. I'm thinking it might be an, an annual thing. Go to the park on 420, set the table yeah. up. It was a good time. Gotta yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. You gotta nice. use. You gotta tell people out there, especially when you're around a crowd of like, you know, smokers and marijuana users. Like, yo, like smoke your weed. Yeah, but also wear it. Yeah. If you're about the plant. Like you want to wear it too. Wear your weed, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that shirt. That's nice. Cool. Um, awesome. All right. So you got a lot going on. You're a busy guy. You have a handful of different companies. How, got a family. Like, How do you maintain a work-life balance and kind of juggle all these things at once and kind of keep everything on track? What are some tips yeah, that you have? For sure. Exercising personal discipline um, is the cornerstone of all of it. And I would definitely be lying if I were to say that my life is balanced. It's not, it's a constant struggle um, to create balance and keep it balanced. And sometimes uh, certain periods of time, it's gonna be out of balance. So like, I think about balance on more of a macro level than on a micro level where people will wanna like, I need to relax today and uh, I worked really hard earlier. So now I need to like do this or like I spend a lot of time my business and I need to go spend time with my family, which I do on a micro level too. But I think more so, um, like for 10 years, I'm going to grind it out. And then for, for the next 10 years, I'll, I'll be in a position where I can spend more time with my family and I can spend uh, more time on that side of things. <clears throat> and then that's where the balance, like for 10 years, I'll be out of balance. But then at the next 10 years, will then bring that balance back. And that's why I say like on that macro level, there is a balance. Um, but there are times as an entrepreneur, especially in the cannabis space, especially with multiple, you're not going to have balance. And so part of it is accepting that. Uh, and then that doesn't mean that I don't still strive to have balance. It doesn't mean I completely give up on it. Uh, it just means that I'm aware that I'm probably not going to be able to attain it. And that way I'm not disappointed and frustrated with myself when it doesn't. And then I can communicate to other people too, that like, Hey, you know, this, these are my priorities. And so, um, don't be upset if if you're or if this project is not, uh, you know, going to get the attention or energy you wanted it to, because this is what I'm currently this is where the scales tipped, you know, mm -hmm. um, but but personal discipline is a major part of my lifestyle. And uh, I constantly am doing discipline challenges because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's time management, which I'm not the greatest at, but I'm getting better at. Um, and it's communication and it's controlling the, the controllables, which in business, you know, there's a lot of unknown and uncontrollables and then even more so in the hemp and cannabis space. And so controlling the things you can control, like what you're eating, uh, drinking enough water every day and exercising, um, you know, going back to the things you can control um, and also doing those things even when you don't feel like it and um, <clears throat> creating time for the things that are important to you and then also creating time to work <clears throat> on your business and not just work in your business so, you know that's things like taking a step back and seeing um what are my systems looking like and how can i improve them do i even have systems do you have sops if you do have sops how can you make them better um things like that how's your team culture how can that be improved these are all things that that are not you busy in your business making deliveries or making your product or making posts or whatever you're you're literally this is some of the hardest work that doesn't look like hard work and it it was a struggle for me to realize that but you're just sitting there doing this and then you're writing so thinking and writing are super crucial um because then that's what's going to help you make sure you're not spinning your wheels or going in the wrong direction and especially if you're a founder and you're and you're a visionary entrepreneur the way i am that is your role your role is to steer the ship and so in order to steer the ship you got to look up and look out you know because if you're just head down you know nose in the grindstone you don't know where you're going and that's the whole point of building a team your, your team will row but you got somebody has to steer 
And so that's my job. Mm-hmm. Nice. I appreciate that perspective. That's uh, some actionable advice for people as well. Whether I mean, this is this is some stuff like whether you have a business or not. Also, just like in general, sure. just a nine to five, and you have other things trying to balance. So that's cool. I appreciate that. Nice. Um, so when you talk exercise, I know in uh, the podcast that I listened to of yours, you had mentioned that um, you were rock climbing, working at a rock climbing gym, and if you if you go to your social media, you'll see some parkour and different movement related stuff. So what's some, like, are you still rock climbing and doing movement stuff is what's like your favorite way to kind of stay active? For sure. Yeah. Uh, fitness and movement is, is a huge part of my life. You know, it's been a part of my life since, since I was born basically. But, uh, when I was five years old, uh, I started tumbling, doing handstands. Uh, I was in gymnastics for a bit when I was five, I was a cheerleader when I was 13. I played football from eight years old to 18 years old. So I have a lot of background in just like fitness and training in general. And then uh, when I graduated high school, I kind of delved into, and that's what got me in trouble when I was talking about the health crisis. I started, uh, you know, going hard into bodybuilding and learning more about body sculpting and that style of exercise and fitness. And then after that, uh, I started getting into like yoga and mobility and back into like acrobatics and circus arts and expanding my movement practices from the traditional, you know, like barbell training and dumbbell lifting and stuff like that to more non-traditional things like climbing and rings, you know, gymnastics rings and rope climbing and uh, just body weight training mostly. Um, I incorporate some barbell stuff now, but I would say my favorite is uh, doing parkour. Uh, for me, parkour is is a multitude of things to me. It's it's a mode of fitness and activity for sure, but it's also expression. It's art. You know, it's almost like dancing through your environment. It's very freeing and creative, while at the same time practical. Uh, the whole point of parkour is uh, getting point A to point B as smoothly, efficiently, and safely as possible, and uh, that's that's fun. You know, it's also it's just a fun thing. You're basically playing in your environment, which is what I always did as a kid. Um, but so there's I, I really like it because it's a mix of practicality with creativity. Um, and so there's this bodily expression while at the same time you're getting a really good workout. And at the same time, uh, it requires mobility and it requires body weight strength. Uh, and so I like all those things. And so parkour is probably my favorite. I haven't been climbing as much as I used to and want to. I need to get back in the climbing gym, um, but I still exercise daily. And then part of what I do periodically is I do the 75 hard challenge uh, that was made by Andy Frisella, which is like, it's a discipline challenge, but part of it is working out twice a day. And so um, I'll mix in there. Trail running is also one of my favorites now as well. I love to trail run, be in nature uh, and then find that flow. And one of my favorite things is actually smoke cannabis before I run. And so, I like to talk about being a cannabis athlete and consuming cannabis in addition to your uh, athletic de- endeavors to enhance it, whether that's in recovery or in focusing on whatever it is you're doing. Um, and I'll, with that, the last thing I'll end this with is if you are using cannabis in, in your like fitness and athletics, um, I personally don't like to use it when I'm doing something like parkour or tumbling um, because that's very, um, takes a lot of uh, awareness, body awareness, and uh, it takes more um, coordination and focus. And so where I find I get the most out of using cannabis is when I'm doing something more like cardio, like the trail runs is my favorite. Something that's just repetitive, doesn't take a lot of coordination and thought, but you're doing it for a long time and uh, becomes meditative very quickly. That's why I really like trail running, especially in, in nature is because it, it's like a meditation. It's like a moving meditation. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's a little bit about uh, my journey. And so I also used to, I used to coach a lot of people don't know because I don't talk about it too much, but uh, I used to coach tumbling, parkour and gymnastics. And uh, every now and then I still do private lessons for people that want to learn how to flip and do handstands. Cool. Nice. That's that's a lot of different stuff there. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because in terms of like, when we talk about the stigma of just a can, like a general cannabis user, the stigma there is lazy stoners, exercise is the last thing that someone's going to do when they're smoking weed. It's like, you're going to smoke weed, sit on the couch, stuff your face with snacks and play video games or something. So it's always, it's always interesting when someone is, is very active and 
it's a part of their routine and it like helps you get into a different mind space when you're doing something like that. And through your experience, you've found kind of where it fits and where it doesn't fit. And I think that's, that's kind of part of like responsible cannabis use and like the actual kit, like cannabis user is a better representation uh than just kind of like slapping a label on you use cannabis you're lazy like uh there's sure. there's a lot of people that i'm sure that we both know that um you know are very successful use cannabis on a regular basis so do, just highlighting a story like that is is a way to kind of just continue to eliminate that stigma so i appreciate you you sharing that story because that's that's good me personally i've always i it was kind of a similar thing. Like whenever I would do any like strength stuff, I kind of quickly realized like, nah, I can't, I can't consume cannabis before this. Um, but similarly, like anything. Any, yeah. I just didn't, I like, I never felt the same. Like I felt like my capacity to kind of push was not, was not there when I was consuming cannabis, but in terms of more kind of flowy things like, you know, going to yoga or like rolling jujitsu yeah. or running and stuff like that, then it's, it's very beneficial because it, it really is kind of helps you get into that like meditative state for me as well. Um, but sure. you know, everyone's different. And so it takes experimenting sure. and just messing around with stuff and, and eventually you'll kind of find, uh, what fits you best. Cause everyone's endocannabinoid system is different. Like I can yeah. take a hit of something. You could take a hit of something. We're going to have a very different, uh, or could have very different reactions to that same product. So, uh, there's mm -hmm. no kind of one, rule fits all for when it comes to cannabis for sure yep. yeah cool nice well we'll we'll wrap it up there any kind of final parting words that, that you might have uh i guess just for people listening you know i encourage you guys to um support the industrial side of cannabis um and then even on the marijuana side uh, support your local small growers, you know, do your research and look into the dispensary you're shopping at, look into the brand that you're shopping with and uh, ensure that it's not owned by some big candy company or pharmaceutical company. Look for locally owned, uh, women owned, uh, people of color owned uh, cannabis businesses, because ultimately we're the ones who have been in this industry, you know, when it was a black market. We're the ones that risked our lives. Some of, us, some of us actually went to prison and jail for this because that's how much it means to us. We actually care about this plant so much so that we're willing to give up our freedoms for it. Uh, so make sure that you're being a conscious consumer um, and then also making sure that if you need some new shoes, go look into hemp shoes. If you need some new shirt or a new uh, dress, if you're a woman or a bra or underwear or whatever, go look and see if you can find a hemp made version. Uh, it's going to cost a little more, but make that investment because it's you're investing in a more sustainable future. And then it's also an opportunity to show people and talk to people about how cannabis is more and how you love cannabis and you like to smoke it, but you also like to wear it and you also like to use it, uh, you know, for your your you did redid your floors in your house and you decided to do hemp wood flooring. And, uh, you know, so look into other ways you can use the plant and support the industry. Uh, now because that's what what's going to help it get established and get the price points lower so yep. i just encourage people to support support it we need it demand nice. more hemp yeah i love that thank you man and then uh so in the description of the video this will be on youtube spotify apple Podcasts, all that in the description i'll put links to mj's hemp famous juice company all those things i know uh, i'm about to join that mailing list to stay up to date on the famous juice company update so i encourage people to do oh. the same and obviously if you're in texas and you somehow don't already know what amos is up to uh add your name to that to that mailing list stay up to date and uh besides that yeah thank you very much man for coming on i really appreciate your time and i'm very much looking forward to kind of continuing to watch your development famous juice company's development and uh and everything that you got planned for the future yeah, brother. Thank you, Matt. And uh, it's been an honor to uh, watch you grow and flourish in this industry and become a leader. Uh, that's what it's about. Yeah. Keep thanks, rocking, man. Bro. Will do. All right. See ya.